Welcome to Interverse. This is Chance reporting in for podcasting host duties. I'm happy to be bringing you this episode today with my very excellent friend, Nathan Crabtree. You may have seen the title of this episode and might be wondering, what is the great work that you're talking about? And if you're not wondering that yet, then later in the episode, you might think that question for sure, because we talk about it a lot and we define and describe it in great detail later on in our conversation. But I'd like to give a quick understanding of the concept. That is, it's the work that one does to improve their own self and help others around them to do the same. It is working on yourself in an actual loving and compassionate way, not working on something that serves your lower self, like the pursuit of an addiction or money. And helping others means you're actually seeing them for what their potential is and encouraging that to emerge, their higher self potential. So anyway, it's actually the same thing. When you're looking at reality from the perspective that all is self and that each and every single supposed other is actually another you in a different experience, tunnel of linear consciousness experience, uh, whether or not you tend to look at the world in this way, I'm here to tell you it's actually the true way of things. You can experience it or not. But uh, something I like to talk about on this podcast are the principles and qualities of our universe that essentially behave like laws and that are eternally in effect and waiting for us to consciously understand. One of these principles is the law of polarity, which when cognized is a way of understanding the apparent duality in our universe as actually being non-duality. How does that work? It's because with each seeming polarity, there is one pole that is real and another that is an illusion. And don't get that confused with gender because gender and polarity are different. An example, though, um, is that our perception of light and darkness, light is the reality in our universe, and it's actually um, the only reality, and darkness is non-substantial. You can't shine darkness into a lit room, for example. Darkness is only the absence of light. It's not a reality unto itself in any way other than our perception of it as such from a relative perspective of being in a place that has more or less light. Hot and cold are the same way. It's actually just heat and the lack of heat energy that creates the illusion of cold. But the cold itself is only an abstract relative idea. Even absolute zero can only be defined as such because it's a way of saying no heat. It might seem like a pointless logical distinction, but it's actually re really important to see the world in this way because it helps you cut through stuff that's not true and see the underlying reality of stuff. Um, like the idea that there's a pole called unity and a pole called separation to go back what I was talking about before with your consciousness, um, being the same consciousness that everybody else is sharing from different subjective perspectives. Uh, if the poles in this idea are unity and separation and they're supposed to be opposites, but they're not because of the law of polarity, then there's only unity and your relative position in perspective to that unity. So your lack of unity, your separation is all just carried in your perceptual vehicle and it's not actually substantial. The only actual barrier between you and the universe you're in is your mind. It creates the wall through your five senses, all of which is actually a complex interactive hologram that's being projected onto the inside of your skull. That skull happens to be embedded in an infinitely expanding and vibrating field of energetic consciousness that has seen fit to create several other skulls and fill them with infinities too. It's a wildly exciting way to exist if you're an infinite soul that incarnates through a variety of life experiences, but as Nathan and I talk about it in this episode, it is not without problems and pain, which illusionary as they may be, still exist in our world and therefore within our own selves. So back to the idea of the great work, as I briefly touched on, it's about the evolution of this shared dream world towards a better expression by the individual's effort to change their own small fraction of the totality. So that's probably enough about that for now. And I'll remind you, Nathan is, if you don't tell, if you can't tell from this episode, Nathan's a really great host of his own podcast. He's really entertaining and informative. 
And his podcast is called Nathan's Freedom Zone. I also made his logo for that. And I guess if you need some kind of like graphic done of that type, maybe you could hit me up and we could make a deal. Um, you can go find his podcast on SoundCloud or look it up on iTunes. Either way, you can probably find it by typing in Nathan's Freedom Zone, I think. But on SoundCloud, his user profile is like Crystal Demon. Which maybe, I don't know, Nathan, if you're listening, maybe you should change that just so it's consistent and people find you easier. Or not, it's your life and your content is very entertain lightning, which is a word I just made up. I think anyone who's interested in what Nathan and I talk about should definitely check out his show. And the uh, other information we reference quite a bit in this episode is the work of the podcaster Mark Passio, who I have certainly brought up before. And Nathan actually introduced me to this uh, particular podcast, which is called What on Earth is Happening. You can Google that. Um, and you can also find everything I'm talking about in the episode links in the description or whatever page you're accessing this through. So um, that's easier than typing stuff into the Google machine. But back to Mark Passio, who is a shared, uh, I guess you could say teacher from both Nathan and I, because we both have learned from his podcast uh, he's not the only person who teaches about natural law principles of the universe or occult symbolic magic or about the ways that people are deceived by our culture and especially about the great work and how to do the great work and how to help other people engage in their own consciousness evolution. Uh, he's not the only person who talks about that stuff, but his podcast is really done Really well done. So it's like one of the most effective sources where you can learn this type of stuff in an order where it'll make sense. Because one of the problems with getting into expanded consciousness information is there's a lot of it. And it's a it's a really weird and wild internet out there. And you can find everything you ever need on there doing your own research. And you will always kind of find exactly what you need if, you're, you know, if your intentions are to find the truth. It'll show up. But... Mark Passio um, gives all of that in a really useful order. And we talk about him with Passione. Sorry, that's a bad son. P bad pun. Bad son. It's a bad pun. It's getting late in the, here in the studio there, guys. Uh, I probably need to go to bed after I record this. So uh, I want to ask you for some help on this podcasting journey I'm on because you're really the only one who can do that. The best way you can be sure that you are part of growing this thing called Interverse into something that might be helpful to people in the future, which is what I hope for, is to donate some of your fiat currency via our Patreon site. It's very easy to sign up and pledge a monthly donation. And to be honest, would you really miss $1 or $5 from your bank account on a monthly basis? Maybe $5. I would notice that, but I'm perpetually on the edge of broke. But I know I could spare $1 a month and be fine. Actually, I do. I support like 10 people on Patreon because how could I ask for something I was not willing to do myself from you guys, you beautiful, beautiful people. And you will get access to some exclusive rewards if you pledge. And there will be more over time. And the more of you who do actually pledge, the more I'll be able to provide bonus content to the Patreon community. Which is something I really want to do, but I literally do not have a spare second of time in life right now, as things are right now. I, uh, I work full time, which, you know, a lot of you guys do too, which I'm not complaining about that. Other, especially because my job is not nearly as bad as a lot of people's slave jobs. So I'm extremely fortunate in that sense, but it takes up like 48 hours a week for sure when you add in travel time. So that's a lot. That's like all your best thinking time. So I'm trying to fit in. My other obsession, which is rock climbing, I admit I do it more than I have to, but I'm attempting to actually get good at it. And then, you know, podcasting, of course, is my main obsession. And there's a lot of other stuff I'd like to do, especially creating art and sharing that art with you guys, maybe even like creating cool merchandise to, to add to the patron reward structure. And I'm going to get to all that, but it's like just a little bit at a time. I can only grind that out so quickly whenever I'm fitting all these things in, including, um, you know, the aspects of regular life like daily basic functions and cooking and cleaning and shit now, i'm not complaining by any means i love the rhythm that my life is in certainly do it's great but i want to do more of the great work i was talking about before um or at least my version of the great work which is just to create a podcast and to create 
uh, content that is pointing the way towards the fact that you all can create whatever you want yourselves because you are all it. You are all already the thing that you wish you were. You just have to stop wishing and be it. So um, if you want to help me do the great work, uh, because there's only two ways you can go on the mountain of consciousness up or down. And when you're helping somebody go up, then you're helping yourself go up. Then uh, maybe you could help me go up by donating a little money to this show. It'll help me get new equipment, especially. And it will be good karma for you because technically I'm doing what I'm doing with the uh, funding is for the benefit of everyone, theoretically. That's what I'm working to make it anyway. So I pledge to you that your energy will go to a good cause. And one last little jab at your conscience, but <laughs> I'm sorry to do it. But I have to tell you, literally nobody knew pledged to the show last month. And previously we had a steady month to month subscriber increase. And I, I'm saying this because you right now you're on the fence and maybe you just want to go ahead and let some currency loose in our direction. You... Thank you. I knew you would. Thank you so much. Thanks for hearing me out. I'll save the Patreon shout outs of patrons for next week. I do those on a monthly basis for a certain tier of people as a reward. Because I've gone on so long about Patreon, so I'll, I'll get on with the actual podcast now. I love all beings, but I especially love you all for listening to my show. And if you haven't already, remember you can subscribe on YouTube and vid.me. For occasional video episodes there i'll put every episode up there but sometimes i'll actually have videos of who i'm talking with and if you haven't tried vid.me i suggest you look at that because it's way cooler than youtube but i'm just now getting into it you can also follow this show on soundcloud and through the itunes podcast app if you want to make me feel super special awesome leave us a five-star review on itunes it only takes about 30 seconds, maybe 60 seconds, depending on your mental acuity and your digit dexterity. Lastly, you can share this podcast with somebody in person or on social media, which will also give me a tingly positive feeling inside my torso around my belly button region specifically. Even if I don't know that you actually shared the show, um, whenever I feel that, I know that somebody did tell somebody else to listen to Interverse and I felt it tingle. And it's um, quite pleasurable. Sometimes it burns a little bit, and I'm sure there's nothing wrong. And don't worry. So now we can get on with talking to Nathan, host of Nathan's Freedom Zone. And if you are interested in the music you heard playing in this introduction, check out the episode links in the description on whatever medium you are accessing this cast through. All right. Let's go. And it hurts. Yeah, somebody just gave me that. There's a uh, piece of candy. They call it candy in the raver community. Are you familiar with that? No, what's that? Well, are you really not? Well, is it like uh, jewelry that you wear? Yeah, it's a thing that ravers do. Um, I think I've seen that before. So they get those, I think, what are they called? They're just plastic beads. Maybe they're called like pony beads or something like that. I don't know. I always call them candy beads. I guess they call them candy because they look like that candy jewelry that you could get. Yeah, yeah. Are we on yet? Yeah, I just started recording. Okay, cool. So yeah, we're... yeah. Um, the beads. I've seen them. Multicolored, kind of psychedelic. This one's kind of unique though, because it says no flex zone and it's got a hexagram or hexagon and uh, that thing on the guy's chest, it's on a skeleton with like a, a ninja sword and then he's got one on his head too. Very tribal looking, but at the same time it says no flex zone. So it's a really good piece. I really like it. So there are two different pieces though. Um, the first time I ever tried to string beads on elastic and make what you would call candy, you get that thing that's on his chest plate, which I was going for like some sort of face mask. It really didn't work out structurally. But now it's a chest plate for a plastic skeleton Halloween decoration that I have in my studio here. Maybe I should put a picture of him up. I feel like at one point I came up with a name for this guy, and I don't know what it is anymore. Yeah, so dude. he needs a new name. Uh, that guy's really, really awesome, man. I made this eye patch also that's on his head, and I have it on his forehead, so it's like a third eye patch because that's actually – I used to wear it on my head. The reason why the Candy Kids, as they're called – they make this stuff to trade it with each other, though. And it's actually a really cool subculture phenomenon. 
Oh, I mean, trading uh, things just like barter, that's a really good way to do business, especially if you don't have any money. And uh, you just trade services if you want or don't trade them. And in this case, they just trade good vibes and also physical jewelry that they made. But there's this whole, you know how secret society is like to have secret handshakes and stuff. Um, they have this thing called the Plur Handshake. It's not super secret. Anyone will teach it to you. But it stands for peace, love, unity, respect. And it's this, uh, you make the letters or you make symbol, you symbolize those four words with your hands in a handshake. And then while you're still shaking hands, you trade bracelets and it's pretty cool so this one that says no flex zone a guy it's interesting that it's hexagon shaped actually because i was at a show a tipper show have you heard of tipper no he's a really scratch heavy glitch hop dj very popular with the uh with the festival kids and the psychedelic people these days anyway tipper's pretty awesome and i was at this it's at the midland in kansas city is the name of the venue and all in the ceiling there there are these hexagram beehive honeycomb uh, painted patterns. And this guy was looking up at the ceiling and I looked up and went, wow, that's crazy looking. And he goes, yeah, it's really awesome. Here, have this p- giant piece of candy that says no flex zone just because you shared this moment with me and looked up at the ceiling. How cool is that? That is really cool, man. That guy's cool. I kind of like that style too. Um, the other style uh, as an alternative to money you could just give people stuff, and that's really the ultimate economy. As Mark Fascio would say, the gift economy is the solution to the money system. Like He says in the most highly advanced societies, people just give each other stuff because they're so not in scarcity anymore, and there's so much abundance that they just don't even mind, right? And it's probably a mindset that you can just take with you if you choose to be very generous, and uh, that would probably increase the world's karma and also – um, help to overcome not, you know, good karma is what I meant, not bad karma. It would increase the world's, uh, decrease the world's karma, I guess, and increase good vibes. Yeah, I guess karma is really only a thing if you're having bad karma. You don't, That's like, what the, the, the word is supposed to mean <clears throat> based on what I heard from, you know, in India. They always say it's bad, which I sort of adopted the use of that word in that way. Well, going back to raver culture and specifically transformational festival culture, there's a lot of them that are taking on the gift economy idea very strongly, especially the Burning Man. Although I'm sure at this point it's large enough that Burning Man's probably infiltrated in a variety of ways. It doesn't really matter because if the people are changing from within in a group like that, then any kind of self-created uh, authority structures that try to impose themselves on the group won't be able to do much because you can't control free humans. And one thing they do at Burning Man, as far as I know, I've never been, but they have, they have, you can't buy anything with money there except ice and coffee and water. Or I don't even know if you can buy water. There's like maybe toilet paper, things like toilet paper, ice and coffee, something like that. Like almost nothing is allowed to be purchased with money and everything else is either trade or gift and people literally do just give each other everything and um each person tends to come with like a supply of something that is their thing that they decided to bring and then everybody shares their thing and then everybody has a lot of stuff that's what i do man because i know a lot of people who need the items like i make organite and i've already given probably 30 or 40 tower busters away only because so many people need it, and it's like they don't even have money. Nobody has enough money, right? And if, if you try to charge them money, then they'll be like, well, I don't know if I need it. I need to think about it. And it's like, yeah, bro, you need it. Trust me. And then they'll get in their <laughs> head about it too, and they'll be like, man, I paid $50 for this piece of Organite, and it didn't do jack shit. It's worthless. But if you get something freely as a gift, you have a lot more of a connection to it because you're not – you're not limiting that that thing's conception through a monetary value that you've now associated with it. So like the piece that you gave me, it's worth it's worth something way better than money to me, which is oh, like man. some peace of mind. I'm actually – I'm holding it right now. Let's talk about organizing. We didn't really even get onto that subject as much as maybe I'd like to last time you were on the show. And mm-hmm. I think – you must know more about it than me because you make a fuckload of it. <laughs> well, yeah, thanks. I've learned quite a bit about it. 
Uh, so it's a uh, shape, and you can choose any shape that has a mold. You just buy a mold, and you can pour this mixture in. That'll harden into little shapes, and the mixture is like a plastic resin. Um, I use isop phthalic uh, resin, but you can also get epoxy resin, and the epoxy resin is easier to work with for a beginner for sure because the catalyst for that resin is only you only you need it exactly half as much as you need of the actual resin whereas for the other kind that I got I've got both kinds but isophthalic resin you need just a tiny amount of catalyst and I figured out that the catalyst is the fire element and it's an alchemical reaction and an experiment every time so the water element is the um, plastic resin itself the fire elements the catalyst and for the isophthalic uh, fiberglass resin uh, it's what is called or poly polyester resin that only needs like a teaspoon or a tablespoon of catalyst. And if you get it wrong, it'll screw up real bad. And it'll, if you get too much, it'll harden into tiny little rocks in no time. So you got too much fire and it created an explosion. But it's more like an implosion where it all sucks into itself into this hard little rock. And it'll happen before your eyes. Like if you get too much fire, it'll happen in like five minutes or less. And so you you want to get the right amount of fire to where you have a little bit of extra time just in case something goes wrong or you get carried away, right? Because I've screwed the the experiment up probably three times, and two times were double batches. And the first time was enough to make like a, a decent pyramid, like eight inches uh, Cheops Egyptian style pyramid, you know? But I so I've screwed up like five of those. <laughs> Five of those pyramids worth of stainless steel organite. And if I would have just used less fire is what it was every time. It was always uh, – I had too much fire. Go but, figure, right? Yeah, like yeah, astrology, sense, right? right? <laughs> so you just <laughs> don't need that much fire, and it's only a tiny little bit. But with the uh, epoxy resin, it's always half the amount of uh, water, so you, you don't have to worry about that. And it takes like two or three hours for the epoxy to harden. And so you got plenty of time. That one's much easier, but I like the results of the other one better because you can actually feel the metal on the surface of the organite and whatever whatever else you were to put in there, you can feel it. Whereas with the more plasticky epoxy resin, it's more gluey and it's almost like you can't feel the metal compared to it. I know what you mean. I've uh, got both kinds of organite in my possession um, and the kind that you made with the stainless steel powder that is the more metallic exterior – it does feel – it feels more like a metal object, I guess. And yeah. it feels a little – the the energy is definitely a more noticeable density of charge, I would say, with, oh, good. with that feeling. Um, but then again, the other piece I have is pretty light. And so maybe this would be an all right time to explain more about what Organite is really like intended to be used for and how – we can do our best to bro science explanations of how it actually works. Oh, hey, what's up? We got a live caller to the show, guys. <laughs> no, not quite. That not was a quite. text message. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but yeah, Organite, it, it fits all kinds of different shapes. And the reason why you fit it into specific shapes, from what I understand, is that's just one level of the energetic creation of yeah. the – Shapes themselves, especially if you start studying sacred geometry or just any kind of uh, ancient mystery tradition conceptions of the universe, you'll come into immediately learning about what qualities the different shapes contain. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're all different. And like a pyramid will have two separate directions that it transmits energy. It's sort of like a light, a form of light that comes out of it. It's uh, very weird. But the pyramid will shoot it out the bottom or the base of the pyramid in the shape of the pyramid, depending on, you know, the angle that was in the corners and everything. So it'll shoot a big, broad um, beam out like that, like a big square that gets bigger and bigger as it goes out. And then at the top of the pyramid, there's a point. And so that shoots a tiny laser beam like thing out the top that you can actually aim if you if you have a pyramid and um, it's more much more fine and you could use it for, I guess, more surgical like. Uh, precision. Yeah. And uh, what that ends up being, I guess, is different for the user. But what is being generated is a type of energy. They call it organ energy. And it's 
somewhere in the layer between the physical energies and etheric energies. Um, there's at least according to like hermetic thought and teaching and other many, many other, uh, ancient occult traditions of conceptualizing the cosmos beyond the physical realm and between the physical and the purely spiritual realms, there are layers of density, like layers of an onion and there's different types of matter that emerge and different types of energy and because energy and matter are the same thing that are flowing in those different layers. And, um, with organ energy, it is one of the higher, less dense, but still connected to the physical realms of energy. And I think maybe a way of describing why that's possible in my ability of understanding anyway, is that first you're filling this object with several different types of minerals, crystals, um, metals, metals, things that have certain vibrational frequencies that are uniform because it's a singular crystallized type object. So, you know, like quartz has a particular frequency that it puts off, right? Yeah. A vibration, a vibration. Everything has got a vibration. Yeah. I've even noticed certain stones like Moldavite have a vibration that you can almost feel if you hold it in your body field. And, and the Moldavite itself sort of feels like a tick, like a clock, a really fast clock. See, it, Chance has a really good quartz with like rainbows in it. Yeah, it's called Angel Aura, and they fire that with platinum to give it the rainbow effect. Oh, yeah, and it's got um, Moldavite in, in this little wrap that is made out of like silver, it looks like. that He, he wear it's a pendant, and uh, Moldavite itself gives off this really fast little click, almost like a metronome that goes really, really fast. I've noticed that off Moldavite. I, I have two on me, actually. But... Um, it's a good one to keep near your heart because it's a green, powerful heart chakra yeah. stone. That's a big I hunk you've got right there. And, two of them. and we should talk about Moldavite in a second. But to go back to explaining the – wow, that's another big hunk. To explain the uh, difference or the, the difference in this type of energy from, you know, like a, electricity or heat energy, things that we're used to, um, Organite is working – by combining these energy fields and frequencies that different crystals, stones, metals are putting off, um, you're creating a type of harmonic resonance. That's true. And it depends on what stuff you put in and the amount of each stuff. So one of the differences between the organite that I made and this other piece that he has, although I haven't seen it tonight, what I'm guessing is because mine feels heavier and it probably weighs more, that means there's more material in the actual resin, so more dense material too. Like the heavy metal, um, it's supposed to work really well if you get a lot of heavy metal in it. Like that was one of Jay Parker's secrets that he told me because he makes Organite and he's in the Free Your Mind group, and I have a lot of his pieces. He's actually got a metal powder in there. Like this is made out of powdered metal, which is supposed to work better than larger pieces, but he has have a lot of larger pieces of aluminum and brass in them and his is really really awesome it has a specific frequency that feels way different than the kind that i make and i have another kind made by ken rolla and uh i imagine that some aspects of it would be actually holding on to the frequency of the person who created it Uh, because i know like quartz for example can hold energy and store it like information and so when you combine those physical frequencies and create that har- harmony, like whenever you've got multiple notes on a guitar playing that are creating a chord, and then you contain that in a shape that is a archetypical shape that has a vibratory energy inherent just in that shape that our unconscious minds all understand, because all shapes do have those type of connotations, then that's where you're bridging the gap between the physical and the non-physical energies with with the organite that's where your the harmonic energy resonance that's essentially something getting generated out of nothing because that's kind of what harmonies do you know whenever you have two notes that play together it's almost like that higher tone is coming out of the ether right right that's exactly what organites like so organites doing that with the frequencies of the physical of the objects that are contained in it and the archetypical the shape that they're contained within in a perfect structure and the harmony is in that ether realm and that is 
uh, for whatever reason, seems to be really good for you to have around, right? <laughs> yeah, it's very bizarre. Like in the uh, plastic resin, if it has a lot of heavy metal powder in it, well, it's almost like it's floating around and it's frozen together in this little configuration that's three-dimensional with little particles in the 3D configuration. And I put other types of powder and also just larger stones in there, like uh, shungite. I put shungite powder in, and that's supposed to be really good for absorbing negative energy from water and on probably a body field. So there's powdered shungite in there, and that by itself is supposed to block electromagnetic frequency radiation, or EMF radiation. And that's one of the advantages of carrying organite uh, or choosing to buy organite or something is that it really transmutes uh, EMF radiation into something that is not um, harmful. Somehow it's doing something to the frequency field and making it more coherent so that it doesn't damage your body as much and cause stress. Like Right. It's a coherent thing, a coherent thing. Yeah. Um, because – our bodies have these frequencies. Our bodies are most our our bodies generate and are the receptors of these frequencies in a sense that are all around us. And particularly to uh, to talk about crystals holding information like we did. Well, water is crystal in liquid form. Believe it or not, all water is a crystal at all times, and that means it holds frequencies and information very well too. So whenever we're surrounded by frequencies that are dissonant, like Wi-Fi and um, radio frequencies, things like that, that are lower on, on the spectrum and, and microwave and just EMF that comes off of electronic devices, all of that interferes with the water in our bodies more than anything else, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. But With uh, Organite, you can create a coherent field and right. the dissonant fields that are entering the um, – Entering the, the the range of the organite, essentially, yeah, they get restructured to the stronger, the dominant field, I guess. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't block your cell phone reception. Right. It's really good stuff for sure. Um, like for take for example, you're walking around with your cell phone, and the cell phone is like a miniature microwave device, because it's all every time it's turned on, it's broadcasting or trying to receive a signal, and so you can you get to where you're sensitive to it after carrying around organite for a long time. You can tell the difference, and you can actually start to directly sense um, electromagnetic frequency coming off. Using the third eye, and also you can feel it, but it comes off of cell phones really strong. And I just upgraded to iPhone 7 because my iPhone 5 broke, and it felt like the 7 had a little bit more power coming off of it. Definitely. I have one too. I experienced that whenever I carry it in a pocket without some kind of protection, like a nice piece of shungite or organite with it. Um, it doesn't have to be in the same pocket either. I just need, like, if I have it on my person, that helps. But, um, Sometimes even when I do have some like some kind of protective device in one pocket and the uh, phone in the other pocket, I will feel a type of discomfort. It's hard to describe exactly because it's not like – it's almost like slightly warm and just icky feeling in the spot of my leg where I'm carrying the phone. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not the only person that's felt that. I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, and – Carrying carrying this stuff though does really diminish that effect. Uh, ultimately, it does. Even with something like Organite, I wouldn't put a cell phone in your pocket for a long time unless you switch it to airplane yeah, mode. Yeah, man. Um, airplane mode helps. You won't get blasted so badly. Cell phones are they're getting strong, and they're supposed to come out with 5G networks, which is supposed to be like way way stronger than the networks now. Like something like a uh, hundred times they're strong, or ten times. Orders you know? of magnitude stronger. Yes. Something like that, and. It's going to be supposedly a lot more deadly like for people walking around. It gives you this annoying feeling in your brain. I've noticed just walking under power lines now that the electricity, the electricity will arc off the power line and somehow it will pick up your body field and it will go through you back into the wire. So just from walking under normal power lines. And I notice it really is much, much more annoying and obvious when you don't have the organite. That's when I first noticed it was happening because – I usually carry it around everywhere, and I never noticed it until I forgot it one day. And then I was running down the street under power lines, and as soon as I got under the power lines, I noticed them. And then I was like, 
then I was like, oh, I don't need to go back and get my Oregonite. I'll just finish the run up. So I ran all, my normal like three miles all up and down a street with power lines on either side. And then, you, you know, it was like the electricity was following you all down the street. And you, I would cross the street and it would sort of follow me halfway across the street. And as soon as I got to the middle, the other power line on the other side would pick up my field again. So I, it just made me think that people are driving down these streets like uh, hours every day. Everybody does it. Yeah. And sometimes there's so much power lines on the street. I've started to notice it. Like at intersections, they can go across the street and then they can go right over you and just sit, sit in that environment. The whole city is wired up. And if, you know, a lot of, I don't know if anyone in this audience is really someone that's going to be like skeptical of, organized or skeptical that emf is bad for you uh, uh, hopefully not too skeptical but even if you are highly skeptical of these things just think about it like people's bodies are sort of metaphorically like a microchip and the more finely you tune your microchip like nathan and i are trying to do by improving our diets and cleaning up our thoughts, behaviors, and actions, and doing what's called the great work right. um, and invoking the divine creative intelligence within our being as much as possible, which is the same for everybody, and we can all access it. But whenever you do start getting more finely tuned, if you were, even the slightest grain of dust or speck of sand in the microchip can throw the whole thing off. If the thing was already out of whack, then of course it doesn't matter if you're not going to, you know, if you're already highly out of whack and you go under a power line and then not, and you walk away from a power line, you probably really won't notice anything. Right. It's like the, the level of sensitivity though does increase the further you go in trying to like purify your body, I guess, or get does, healthier. Uh, yeah. And I think the psychedelics can activate that um, quite a bit as well. It's just, you know, you want to do that in a conscious context and for the right reasons. And, you know, listen to the spirit. If it tells you you've had too much or something, you just stop. And it's very self-regulating uh, because it, the spirit will let you know when you've had enough and then you won't want to go. And if you go further, you might get into some fear that you have to overcome or something that could be overwhelming. And or it might slow you down from doing work that you're meant to be doing now that you've had an experience that's worth integrating. Because if yeah. you just do nothing but have psychedelic experiences and you don't go about making changes in your life, then yeah. you it doesn't usually go well. Now, right. Some people can actually get into a flow where they make the changes rapidly and go, continue working with the medicine as rapidly as they're making the changes. But it's kind of like kind of like going downhill on a longboard. And the longer the hill and the longer you try to go – the faster things speed up and the harder to keep your balance it can be. And then if you crash, you can get really fucked up essentially. And so I'm not discouraging somebody from, uh, you know, quickly moving along the path of self purification or self change, you know, but like an example would be somebody that got so gung ho about new, their newfound connection to their own spirit, uh, that they just, um, immediately quit their job and, all of a sudden they're getting kicked out of their house by order followers because they're not paying their bills. And, you know, all those things, maybe it is a good idea to just cease and desist right away, depending on what your job is. But there's also such a thing as smooth transitions and it's not necessarily the wrong way to go, depending on what you're doing. There's certain practices that should just be ceased instantaneously though. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you actually make it closer to source and higher up in the dimensions towards the heaven and away from the hell is that uh, you admit you're wrong and then you change your behavior and stop accumulating that karma, which is can be a habit and it can be a lifestyle where people get into these karmic uh, bad situations from their own choices over years and years and years. And then all of a sudden they're addicted to it. And that's almost like the eternity of human progress is who can let go of their addictions and their uh, baggage and, uh, correct everything that needs to be corrected in the physical, mental, and spirit world, including themselves, the microcosm. And then uh, equally as important, 
maybe even more important is once they've taken care of the microcosm, helping other people to also take care of the microcosm. That's the only way out of the situation that humanity is currently in. And it's a precarious situation. And if human, it seems like the speed, time is speeding up and the vibes are getting faster and faster every year. Every day of every year, it gets more and more ridiculous and more and more crazy stuff happens everywhere. And then it's like, you know, the universe is trying to give you this opportunity to make the right choice and get out at the last minute before it all explodes or something. That's almost how it feels like to me. And I just try to Especially do with best. certain things like I, uh, I came across the information about how many animals were slaughtered per year for planet Earth. And it was <laughs> is madness. It does actually – it makes you laugh, but also only because you're just not crying about it. Well, I laugh a bunch at this kind of stuff, and I'm it's just like, absurd. I, don't, I don't understand why I laugh at it. I don't understand why I laugh at it, but I do. But it's yeah, the number is like sheer absurdity. Billion dollars a year, a uh, billion animals a year, right? Isn't that it? Somewhere in that ballpark, and I think like a good twenty billion animals a year are slaughtered just for the United States alone. Yeah, it's like if you think include about that, the guys. fish animals, it becomes like 150 billion, and all mainly for the meat industry. Right? Pretty much, yeah. And why, why would you ever expect a planet to continue existing with life on it if you kill 150 billion lives yeah, a year? There's a lot of uh, extermination going on right now, like with all of the nuclear wholesale problems. extermination. Like the whole planet is just being raped, kind of, and. It's like I actually channeled in a message from a, like a higher self or something a couple of years ago, and it told me that everyone uh, – there's a lot of sickness going around on this planet, and there's a, ma a maker who's like a gardener, a higher, a higher form of intelligence that is gardening and trying to turn this place into something better. And what he is doing right now, the spirits said, was – he was uh, spraying Roundup on all the plants that had gone bad and, and were ruining the garden. So he had a Roundup can poisoning certain plants to get them out of the gardens because it had gotten so extreme, the sickness. And the message to the listener is from the spirit realm. It said you need to take care of your area and make sure that um, it looks nice so that the gardener will look at your area with favor and uh, otherwise, the poison ones will choke you out, and then we'll have to um, poison the place again because they won, kind of thing. Wow! So it's almost like it's almost like that's a possibility just because of the fact that we are doing that kind of thing to plants and to our gardens. Right. It's as, like a hologram. Yeah, it's a law of correspondence thing. Yeah, as we above, spray round so up below. on things, we're gonna get round up sprayed on us, and then also. We make other things our food. Something's going to make us its food. It's just the right. way that the Isn't universe this, works. Uh, like the uh, law of correspondence in natural law and the hermetic principles. In the hermetic principles, that's what it's known as. But it doesn't really matter what set of principles you're coming at it from or if you just figure this out for yourself. But that which is above is like that which is below. And the crazy thing is if you look at the amount of animals that are being slaughtered by humans, 150 billion sea and, and land animals every year. Then what what under natural law has to be done to humans in order to match that vibration? One of two things. Either <laughs> humans immediately stop what they're doing before that happens or a bunch of poison gets sprayed on their particular patch of the garden, as right, you said. Right, right, right. And it's almost like that's already happening with chemtrails and uh, fluoride and – Oh, that GMO is the roundup. Kim, that's, we were going to talk about chemtrails today. That's it. Chemtrails is Roundup being sprayed on us by God. The bug spray. It's bug, not not God. It's by people <laughs> who are playing God. No, I know, but that's the joke, right? Like, but yeah, yeah there's people that are playing God, and they're wow. Yeah, chemtrails have gotten strong the last couple of days, Nathan. They were not really so strong for a while. Um, hey, listener, I hope that you are aware that out of planes there are chemicals being sprayed and seeded into the sky for the purpose of. Who knows what, but probably geoengineering and um, population reduction. Just wild guesses. If you if you were to t track it down to the root cause, probably what it was is, yeah, population extermination. They're just trying to kill everything on this planet. And they, they trick everyone lower down in the pyramid into going along with that using different excuses. So for one group of people they will see, who are the most psychopathic, they'll just say, yeah, it's population reduction. This is how we kill them now. It's a really easy way. And then that group, everyone will work together in the dark occult pyramid to make sure the media has a certain story that 
stupid people will buy into. And on, in this case, the story is the excuse for why they are poisoning everybody is because they're afraid the ice is going to melt because of global warming. And if they don't spray aerosols into the stratosphere using whatever method they're using. I've even heard of chem rockets now that launch from the ground and spray chemtrails. And if they don't do this, then the sun will get too bright and it'll melt the ice and there'll be a catastrophe. So we're trying to save the world is what their reasoning is. Trying right. to block out the sun to save the world. And they have done it. They like I've heard facts that the sun is like 30 percent less powerful now because of uh, pollution or something, chemtrails or whatever, than it was 100 years ago, kind of thing. And the sun is our source in this dimension, guys. Right, and even um, there were uh, measured changes in uh, over time with solar panels, how much power they could get. Some guy found out that the chemtrails were actually reducing the amount of power you get from solar panels. Yeah, um, just dirtying up the window between us and the infinite very badly. Very badly. Today, man, I'd, this was the first time I had noticed them in quite a while. It's a chance that they were here yesterday, but somehow that escaped my vision, I guess. Well, I was in Arkansas and I saw them yesterday, so maybe that's what it was. Maybe. I don't know, but I didn't notice them until today. And – it's Monday, uh, July 31st, and 2017, and I saw the most ridiculous display of chemtrail that I had ever seen, and I have been watching them in the sky for like three years, and that's the key to understanding them and to realizing that they're real is observing them firsthand over and over again and trying to make a pattern out of why they're, why they're there some days and not other days. And... I couldn't figure it out because they don't follow the weather. It's not – it doesn't matter what temperature it is. They can be out in the winter or the summer, and the humidity doesn't matter. Elevation doesn't matter. Nothing – nothing um, – there's like no pattern. But today what I saw, there was a whole bunch of really beautiful clouds. Normal – I think they're called like cumulonimbus clouds, but big and puffy, uh, a lot of curves and – Sexy clouds. Yeah, really white. And well, then what I saw was behind all the clouds, all through the sky, was loaded with chemtrail and chemtrail haze, which the haze is not really in a straight line because it is a chemtrail that has been sprayed in the past, and it blew in or it diffused a little bit. And when they get enough of them up there, the whole sky gets covered with this haze, and that's what happened today. They were everywhere. Yeah, by about 6 p.m., there were these – the bottoms of all the clouds today were all dark and um, rain cloudy. Yeah. But it wasn't like rain clouds blew right. in. It, it was like, like rain clouds these in the clouds were seeded. And that was – I mean if you want some evidence of the fact that stuff is being sprayed in the atmosphere and has been for a lot longer than just – a short amount of years. Um, yeah. Cloud seeding has been a thing for ages. Long time. They've known about they've known about these techniques and improved upon these techniques. I guarantee it. And um, you know, what can we do about chemtrails, though? You know, I don't want to just complain about something with no solutions to bring to the table. Yeah. What is the solution with? It's really simple. Detoxify your body. That's one. Of, yeah. That oh, I oh, we got to do the great work and tell everybody to stop following orders and then eventually there won't be anyone to uh yeah the great work is really the only way out uh, when you have a standing army um a secret intelligence agency a bunch of order followers all in a cult it's a big cult satanic cult um based on hierarchy and torture and murdering people that's what happens when you go down the rabbit hole and you find out what's really behind the world is uh it just explains all of these – for some reason, so many things trying to kill you that are unnecessary. It's yeah, not did you like, ever notice that everything wants to give you cancer? There's yeah. a reason. <laughs> so much stuff. Almost anything you can buy at the gas station will give you cancer. <laughs> it should just call, be called cancer station. It is. Every, yeah, I freak out because I get gas on my fingers sometimes. So I'm just like – It's bad, man. It's, it's really it's bad. Just, it's happened to me because I tried to pour gas into a, a chiller. And I guess this is part of the karma of gardening. I tried to pour it to destroy all the plants that were there and to till the soil up. 
And what happened, the, for some reason, the cap on the gas can just shot off like there was a spring in there and it failed and then it shot the cap off and it dumped on my hand. Yeah, I, <laughs> I get gas on me more times than not, I think. And that's the problem. That's a big problem. Better start focusing on that one. That one's pretty deadly. So, yeah, stop doing – stop getting gas on yourself, people. Uh, and detox, that's the other thing I wanted to bring up. There's a, a real need for basically – a practice of detoxification in our lives. And this is something I'm preaching right now, but I'm not practicing per se, per se. Uh, I have done cleanses in the past, but I, you know, I think this is something worth bringing up that if we want to actually be focused on solutions and not just right. complaining about problems, um, cleansing and fast based cleanses, I think. And we, I guess this was brought up last episode too. So uh, that's uh, something that's a really powerful solution for getting, Oh, a yeah, lot of this yeah. gunk out of our bodies. Yeah, I do a lot of things in my own personal life that uh, I think at this stage, they're just mandatory pretty much. I mean, nothing is mandatory. Nothing's required of you. But if you want to see the universe change, there are things required. It's always your choice because the universe can change faster and it can be better based on your individual choices and based on what you choose with your will. So it's like it's a test and, you know, whoever wants to get out of these, the uh, Satan realm the fastest, <laughs> they have to contribute to the great work and do it on themselves. And detoxing is like the ultimate step. That's like the, the self thing. Then you start detoxing other people. And it's all kinds of toxins from mental toxins, which are just viruses in the mind, it's beliefs like statism, authority, money, um, organized religion also has all a lot of those of, are organized religions, actually. They are. And um, even a lot of things that can be part of like new age pseudo spirituality, which is a term that I kind of like to call it like they have pseudoscience. They have things that appear to be really spiritual, but it's either not the complete picture or it's a half truth. So it can be true in one sense, but not, but then they, then people think that they re interpret it wrong or it was just wrong. No, it allows them to insert ideas into a, a group of people who are willing to let someone else think for them because this person gave them enough uh, sugar basically that they took the pill, the poison pill. That's how all observation works. They give true, true, true lie, true, true, true lie. That way you'll actually buy it. That's how right. they can be mixed in this toxic perfect lie. example is rich or uh, Russell brand. Oh yeah. What does he say? Have you heard of that guy? Yeah, I know him. What does he say? Uh, he's getting oh. really kind of spiritual looking, right? Is it, is there some sort of deception in there? He is a secret society member, Fabian Society, out of no out of England. Their their emblem, his the society he's a part of, their like their coat of arms or whatever, is literally a wolf wearing a sheep. Right. Wearing a sheep's body. So their whole thing is disinformation and deception to sway political events in a country. And an example of Russell Brand doing this is um in one of the more recent <laughs> Uh, parliament elections, he told all of his followers, don't vote, don't vote, it's wrong, just never vote, it's wrong. You know, that's true, that's true, that's true. Then at the last minute, he told them who to vote for. Did he really do that? Yeah. That and he was married to, Katie, <laughs> married to Katy Perry, who was a monarch mind control slave, very obvious monarch mind control slave. Um, there's, fo there's photograph and video of him flashing, um, flashing symbols at her to make her stop breaking mind control, like obey. Like literally there's a photograph oh, of him holding up an, o an upside down pentagram with the word obey. And she's just like <laughs> zapped looking and there's photographs of this and people are oh still not gosh. like I aware. Mean, that is amazing. You, you should send me that one. Cause that I never knew Russell Brand. Was. He calls his program the trues instead of the news. See that's dark occult red flags. When you see stuff like that, people flashing mind control signs at each other and then people acting like robots out of, out of nowhere or the personality just switching for no reason. It's so obvious. And Katy Perry, uh, feel bad for her. She's clearly um, a ritual torture abuse victim. Right, that's and gotta be true. So Katy many Perry. of her music videos actually depict that kind of thing even. It's crazy. Yeah, the mainstream is just getting more and more overtly satanic and weird. Every year it just gets weirder and They just weirder. want to see how far they can take it, I guess, and people still accept it because they're right. laughing their asses off. It was a big distraction all along. You know, I was watching – I went into a guitar center. They probably know they're in the end game at this point as far as exterminating everyone, so maybe they really don't care that it gets more.
more overt? Well, um, it's just a program that they're trying to hypnotize everybody, similar to the movie They Live. Yeah. Right? And on They Live, what they did, there was a – I don't want to ruin it, but they went – No, go ahead. It's a great thing to run. I don't know, man. Well, so there's – It'll still be a, worth watching. There's mind control going on on Earth. Everyone's hypnotized, just like in the real world today. Everyone's hypnotized by this higher consciousness that they're not aware even exists because they're, they don't purposefully made it to where the slaves don't notice they're being enslaved and they don't recognize who the masters are. In the movie, it's all sci-fi kind of, and they're all these aliens that have just mind-controlled everybody so that they don't perceive them as aliens. Like they can't see their real skin. It's like this electronic – uh, shape shifting, almost like a reptilian shape shifter would do, <laughs> like morph into Hillary Clinton or something, and then just have this persona where uh, normal people can't pick up that she's a total parasitic re reptile. And then not even to say that all shape shifting is bad, because there can be uh, higher level beings that are, are less formless and and material. And if they stay on the right path and, you know, they could be given all types of shape shifting. And crazy see, I don't powers. see, I don't see, um, I haven't seen the evidence yet of actual shape shifting in the dark cult, quote unquote, elites. But I do have a conceptualization of where that information is coming from. Oh, yeah. I mean, first of all, anybody that's completely um, in their what's called the R complex of the brain, which is the reptile part of your brain, it's basically your brain stem. You're essentially thinking in no greater ability than what a reptile would be able to do. Like just someone in fight or flight all the time through chronic stress, through trauma. Yeah, no emotions. No emotions. Right, so that's the limbic brain, the emotions. Right. So people in their R complex, which a lot of people in higher up control structure hierarchies are only in the R complex. Of they the brain. are because there is actually a satanic cult that – runs these institutions and they torture their own children uh, generationally and it goes back like thousands of years and they perfected the method and they just they, they train each um, adult to do it to the next child and then it repeats itself like a program and it's so extreme with the violence and the torture that it just makes you kind of sick but the microcosm of that is that the government has trained American families all to do this same type of thing to On themselves. a lesser degree but still totally happening like with yeah. corporal – with spanking and shit. Spanking and then sending kids to school where they're psychologically kind of traumatized and told – And all their rights are taken away. Right. And they're told that at school they're told that they're not allowed to make their own choices and they – the only thing that matters is the grades which is just made up just like the money system that they're prepping everyone for. And there's just a psychological warfare thing. I'm sure a lot of your listeners are very well aware of this type of stuff. I hope so. And if not, I, I am seeking to expose people more to this kind of thing. But it's also hard because it also it gets people to just shut you off and turn oh, you, yeah, turn yeah, you man, out completely. We need completely. to talk about the solutions because, you know, I've so mastered the problem that <laughs> for me, I could talk about the problem for like six hours and mix in solutions here and there. But the problem's just so big that it's like you need to, to do a lot of talking about the problem, and that's one of the actual solutions, actually. Yeah, because people need to be able to actually see the problem when it's staring them in the face. Right. Because yeah. right now people watch Russell Brand and think that he's not full of shit. That's the real way to break the program. It has to be done on an individual level with multiple people working on it, and the universe will <laughs> – you know, wants you to take responsibility, and if you notice a problem, that's key. That's the key solution, the number one solution. Right, and if there, if you notice a problem in something you don't like in the world, that either means that you need to stop doing something, or it means that you need to start doing something, or both. Almost always stop, though. Yeah, and uh, a lot of times, a lot of times though, there is something that you know, if you did it, it would make things better. Like, let's say someone is being attacked by an attacker who is out of balance and then you while it's not required that you stop the attack if you were to successfully disarm him and and have a re relatively good outcome from it then that would be better than doing nothing and that's and that'll put you into a parallel sort of future where the entire world gets better because you go and you match souls in there that are also making similar choices and it's like if you do your share of the great work, the everyone else sort of, sort of starts to do their share because it's it catches on, you know. Let's define the great work in case it's not a term that I've used enough on this show for just anybody to be familiar with. 
Yeah, yeah, me um, and Chance speak the same language in a lot of ways because we listen to Mark Passio, and he breaks down the problem of the world and all the, the real solutions. Although he's not the only person to call it the great work. What the, the great right. work is a term that's beyond Mark Passio, but this is oh, a yeah. great. He's a great initiator into this kind of information. It's not his information, which is a key caveat. Yeah, he, he's a very, very good teacher. This kind of goes back to the alchemical and Freemasonic tradition. And a lot of spiritual uh, teachings have this sort of embedded in, in even dif- in the different mainstream religions in the Bible and probably the Quran and all the other ones. There will be elements of the truth. Uh, it's just that people, they can't agree on a lot of times what the truth is. And a lot of them don't, haven't learned it yet. Like if you're listening and you haven't learned a lot of this information, that's just more of the truth that by learning it and looking at it, it'll help you to benefit yourself and the rest of the world. And that's really what it's about. You just teach yourself things and read books and don't be afraid to look at something that might be a problem that needs to be fixed because it ain't, it ain't going to fix itself as quickly as you could fix it because you're way more intelligent and, and stuff and capable than the dark occult wants you to think you are. I mean, they're they're just uh, liars, and people need to stop listening to them and let them go into their parallel universe, and you know, just t- take care of everyone that you encounter. You just start broadcasting the message everywhere you go, and take care of the people near you, and get their heads straight as best as you can. That's that's what's required of you. You just at least do something kind of thing a lot of times, you know, but take care of yourself too. And that it's almost like the, Rosa, doing stuff. the Rosicrucians have just a com- the commandment of just try to be a better person than you are being. See, that's a good teaching. <laughs> it's if, a if you understand good. it properly, that's a very good teaching. But not try like, oh, I tried, but now I'm going to just go back to um, being an asshole. It's like as in actively try new things, try in the active sense of, uh, yeah. you know, something new. That's like how I like the, trying uh, a new type of food that's good for you. Or, or the something detox, like, that. like Chance was saying. Like one of my favorite detoxers is a uh, peyote, which is a Native American cactus, and that detoxes you crazy fast. I know it gets stuff out every time, and it can be emotional, mental, um, physical toxins. It detoxes the body super well. And the, uh, the powers that be are so messed up that they made it illegal for normal people to get their hands on peyote and all kinds of other psychedelics. And it's like, so how are you going to detox when they're limiting what detoxers you're allowed to use? Like they had marijuana illegal for so long. And I just saw like an article about cops raiding a uh, grocery store in the U.S. somewhere and stealing all the CBD products and claiming that it was illegal when it wasn't actually. It was federally legal now, but the cops, they just do whatever they want sometimes because uh, they get away with it so much. And they just stole a whole bunch of CBD and the people are like, what? well, how am I supposed to get CBD now to detox? That's one part of the – well, going back to defining the great work, um, you have to not just take in a higher quality of information – and change the quality of your thoughts, but then you also have to change the quality of your speech and your actions, which you kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. It's about bringing those three things, thought and, you know, emotions, emotions and actions. actions. Thank you. What they call the trivium, bringing those into harmony, but it's also information intake, processing and output. Oh yeah. And the hardest part would be actually, and see, I don't even know anybody to really have this kind of conversation with that's an, an extreme order follower, but the harder thing would be trying to help people who are actively engaged in practices that are repressing the freedoms of other people oh, yeah. like police and soldiers. Actually, they're I, the highest priority at this point because they're the ones physically um, <clears throat> putting the chains on everybody. I have a friend who is, um, about who who is ex-military and he's about to now go join a group of uh i don't know exactly what you call them private security yeah somewhere in afghanistan from what i understand he's just going to be working in a building guarding something that he doesn't know what it is or what they're doing Mm -hmm. like watching security cameras most of the day with a gun and so now, I, I don't know if he's listening right now, yeah, but dude, if that's you, a potentially dangerous job, not just potentially dangerous, but you like, first of all, what are you guarding? Right. Second of all, anything and, in there. And this is bad of me because I'm talking about him right now, but I haven't like had this direct of a 
confrontational um, conversation with them about it because it's like, well, I, I don't want to ruin my chance to actually impact his decision making yeah. by getting him to think differently. Right. But like how I how my immediate reaction to a job like that is. You know how in comic books and in cartoons with superheroes, there's like an army of goons that the superhero has to beat up before they get to the main goon. And those guys are all just like following orders and just getting a paycheck and just standard bad guys. Yeah, that's what you're doing if you join a private security company and go watch security cameras in Afghanistan. For all you know, they're trafficking children there yeah, that's or what something. I was thinking. I, if you're just, you know, doing things – that potentially or are in fact hurting other people, then you should stop doing those things, even if it means that you have to quit your job and figure out a different way to make it. So really, so I need to talk to this friend. Like, So I, really what needs to happen is I need to talk to this friend and be like... You should. I mean, the universe will honor that attention. And it'll, it'll bring you what you... If you do it, it'll bring you something. And, and I've done it before many times. Like one time I got this guy who was about to join the military because he was like 18 and his family, for some reason, they all thought it was a good idea. You know, it's happened multiple times. It's but crazy. I just told him about Mark Passio's stuff and I just repeated it to him. I don't, I don't tell him, I told him to go look at Mark Passio and a lot of times people don't want to do that. So then I just start repeating it verbatim right in their face all, all the time. And uh, it works on him, and it got him to to reconsider, and he didn't go. Like, See, I that's the strategy life. I've been taking, but not to like tell him him directly not to go, but to just constantly talk about whenever we're to get, like whenever I'm hanging out with them, talk about natural law, talk about law of correspondence, and talk about the fact that your ne like negative outlooks on things is going to impact what things manifest for yeah, you. Yeah, like period. I have a good example. I I talked to a person who helped the government um, buy guns. They actually sold guns to the government as their job at, for a corporation. And I just told him, I was like, hey, that's a job you should quit. <laughs> I, was, I was like, you know what they do with those for the federal government? Does, does these guns end up with the federal government? And, and she was like, yeah. And I was like, you got to quit that job because uh, you know they, they, what they do with guns, the federal government? They just go and bomb a bunch of children, and you're literally helping. If it wasn't for you, they would have much more difficulty – bombing children and so that means that you should quit yeah. <laughs> you can just put it that way and sometimes you just have to take a chance kind of thing you have to feel out every individual person some people that might not be the, the right way but the truth is always going to have an effect and that's what you're you want to be going for truthful words that are in, in alignment with reality and if you can at least get the truth then it'll have a, a very good effect one, so. Another thing I want to talk about because talking about things is part of that trivium we brought up and the only way to actually get to them, something that I don't actually know how to talk our way to yet, which is to get completely free of even using dollars because these uh, debt notes from the Federal Reserve Bank, yeah. they are intrinsically taxed, which you can't even do anything about it if you have a regular job. It's automatically taxed and you don't know how much of that is going yeah. towards the child bombing right. part of shit. By and just being plugged into this matrix, you are getting karma. Yeah. The matrix is generating. So how do we get completely outside of so that? We're addicted to government as a species. Humans are addicted to government and authority and being told what to do. And it's just a matter, first of all, of getting your own mind in alignment with truth and recognizing it as not valid. The authority and certain people thinking that they're God on earth and they're better than everyone else and they can make up rules that uh, are just their whims and they can be rules that are completely out of alignment. With well, that's the happening law. on the scale of the individual, man. Like yeah, it is. I was that person and still am in a lot of ways, I'm sure. All it, of us are tied into it. We do it on all levels. Like the microcosm of this is the things that people do to their own body that are out of harmony with natural law. And that's how they get damaged bodies. And that's why regular detox, like you were saying, is a very good idea, especially by being on this earth at this time, you know, with just the karma everywhere. Every time someone gets karma, it hurts everyone else in the field. Like um, Mark Passio had this riddle where he was like, how do you definitively know if whether or not you are suffering? And I'll let Chance finish it. Yeah, this is one that – I want you to think about it for a second, guys. I, th I don't know if I've brought it up before, but it's it's not the answer that most people give straight away. Yeah. Um, and most people even aren't at the level of consciousness that they can get this answer. But I think in context to what Nathan just said, you might have already figured it out. 
And the fact is, as we are all emanations from the same source and our experience of consciousness, isness, selfness, I-ness, whatever you want to call it, is the same direct experience of consciousness across all levels in one unified field. And that it's only our subjective separation that lets us have the imagination that we're actually different consciousnesses. And that means that everything that happens to anybody happens to everybody. And therefore, if even one other being is suffering, then you yourself are suffering and you can definitively know that. Yeah. (laughs) And so (laughs) even if you feel like you're okay, there's still – nobody has ever – sat for even one second on this earth as it is in this state without at least a mild sense of extreme discomfort (laughs) i would say that's gotta be true because what is the first thing they do to male boys like in this country as soon oh no as soon as you come in they chop off your foreskin actually they rip it off and with no anesthetic or anything and they're just like well welcome to hell (laughs) so uh what have you done to de to, like in the last you know few months what what has your journey been like as you've uh, evolved through and healed some of that early trauma middle life trauma young adult trauma right because <laughs> well, right. they traumatize us every turn so like they do man um where, where are you at with that process because i i personally kind of know but i wanted to let the audience know because you were on five and a half months ago and yeah. in my opinion i've seen a great deal of confidence come back to you even though i didn't know you before the time that we met back in february um i just know that confidence is an intrinsic part of being secure being so it's like i it's nice to see that coming back into you really strongly not that you were lacking it terribly because you know you came up and talked to me which was cool or who said who said hi first did i say nice grateful dead shirt that might have been it well, actually, I was uh, at Zenith, and you were, and Haley was at Zenith, and I talked to Haley. That's our rock climbing gym. Yeah, the weightlifting section that's about there. So I talked to Haley first, and then uh, then I noticed that you were with Haley, and then we all sort of talked. So uh, something like that went on. It was really nice. You were hitting on my wife? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Maybe. Well, you didn't know. It's yeah, okay. I didn't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. So I told one of my, the things that impressed me about Chance the most, one of them was that I told him about Mark Passio and then he actually went and listened to him and he's like listened to 120 episodes now and he's like like one of the only people that I know that I've met either in Little Rock or Springfield that has ever done that and I was like, damn, he's uh, is hungry for knowledge. I challenge, I I challenge anybody listening to just not even listen to my podcast. Go listen to Mark Passio's podcast. I'm not, and neither of us are like devotees of some person that we're considering a guru. It's like literally just very well packaged information. Very well. I will say if you get into it, skip the intros where he's doing event announcements. Start at episode one, skip the beginning parts. You you can use the fast forward function. It's pretty easy. And just once you hear him start talking about the topic, go for it. And it's worth listening to because... If you want to get an – okay, the beginning of his podcast series, it's all about the problem as he put, as Nathan just put it. So you'll get a really good ability to examine the dark occult and understand how symbols and manipulation methods are employed. And then once you have a good foundation of that understanding, it doesn't work on you. You start seeing it more and more and it – trust me, it makes a difference to know rather than not know. Absolutely it makes a difference because – as soon as you become aware of the problem, the universe, if you put the intention out, the universe wants you to find the solution because they, the gardeners that are um, higher up and just the universal consciousness itself, it wants you to prosper and it wants you to be happy and to be free and not to have your will coerced. And if once you get on the path and in alignment and agreement with the natural laws, which are the laws, of morality and uh, and uh, you know what's going on and how the world works. Basically, just don't steal. That's yeah. basically it. That's the moral principle: is you just don't um, harm another being. You know, you don't cause suffering. You don't steal or rape or kill or trespass is one of them. So you don't threaten other people, basically. And if you, if you just don't do those things, and you and you learn more and more about detox because. Detox is sort of this doing the same thing to your body, which is not you as the last uh, podcast 
uh, the guy that does Lost Arts Radio, he brought that up. He's like, your body and your mind are not you. They're sort of like separate entities. And the body especially, if you are doing something that is harming or robbing the body in some way or, or causing it displeasure and destruction, that's karma. And that's why you feel such negative consequences and suffering in your own mind, even though they're all connected. So you're directly connected to your body in a more spiritual way too, which is why the consequences are so instant. But in the field, which is this shared external reality that everyone wakes up to, that is being generated by everybody's thoughts, emotions, and actions, all collectively generating a shared dream experience that people wake up to and then go to sleep out of. And the only way to change that one for the better is to first uh, fix your own microcosm, which is your, your life. And doing that is the first half and the universe will begin. And it wants you to do that because it knows that you'll be less toxic and more pleasant. And that's all it wants is just people to be pleasant and be respectful and once you learn those lessons, be respe- um, that's a good, that's the perfect word. Be respectful. What does respect actually mean? It's from, well, you have re in Latin, meaning to again something, yes. to again something, yeah, right, right. <laughs> and spectare, uh, which is to look at or to right. view. And honestly, it all comes down to love. And we probably should have come to love sooner because love is really a great catch word, buzzword. But um, what love even is, mm-hmm. is looking at somebody else or something else and wanting, intending the greatest of that thing's potential to unfold. And not a specific potential, but just that it has the choice to make amongst all potentials and Love is uh, essentially it's look it is really it's a desire to be looked at that we all have. We all want to be seen and recognized for what we're doing and recognized as good, essentially. Right. And love is recognizing the goodness in each other. And that's okay. also the same as recognizing potential. So really, that's like developing respect for yourself and self-love is the same exact thing. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> it goes along with freedom and it's required for freedom. And uh, it is freedom. Freedom and love are the same thing. And for, uh, freedom is the external manifestation of the force that we call love. Right. And love is just the force that expands consciousness and increases potential and unfolds potential in in beingness. One so of the best ways to expand consciousness, which is what love is, is to look into things that you need to know and to try to take care of yourself. And that'll lead you on a quest for knowledge. And that's a loving thing to do and to um, prevent your own body from um, parasites and, uh, you know, negative self image and emotions and bad thoughts. It's very straightforward once and once you learn it, uh, especially when you learn that there is such a thing as natural law and the universe does work in certain ways and that the more you know about those ways, the better off you are. That is when you come into empowerment and you don't feel like you're on the plane of effects. That's the ultimate waking up moment, Yeah, really, because up until that point, you feel like you're just at the mercy and whim of random chaotic forces and essentially you are. You're right. – you're, uh, you're a pawn on the chessboard. That's board. how I felt growing up in school is like you don't want to go to school, but everyone tells you you have to. And that means that you're not in charge of your life kind of thing. And that's not freedom or love. Right. And I actually thought about this the other day. Even the freedom that you had as a kid was a, a sort of a false freedom. Like because for me, I had the freedom. I had a lot of freedom and I ch- chose poorly when I was a kid and mostly just played video games all the time. But that was because – I was seeking a certain type of freedom through the experience of um, the same reason that I read a lot of books when I was a kid. I wanted my mind to just no longer have to be stuck in the confines of a reality that worked the way that this one worked. And I wasn't even like depressed. It was just like this shit was boring compared to what – because really if we weren't – if we weren't at this level, 
And that's, I kind of think we even came to this level just to help bring other people out of this level because like, I don't know why I would have come to this level That's what I of reality. Sometimes. I mean, I Because like, I, I want to be like on cosmic adventures, being a magic space wizard well, or something. I don't know. But it kind of like, is an adventure. It is. Just, you just have to wake up to the actual – here that um, until you can get out of a lot of the pain or something – it isn't doesn't feel like a good adventure a lot of times. No, for it, people exactly like the, until you even um, get clear about who the hell you actually are, then you're just another cog in this big suffering machine, the chain of enslavement. Yeah, yeah. And who the you are? Who are you guys? To dumb you down because a lot of these negative uh, people that have control of the world or they're losing control since we did the first half of the great work and we are starting to do the second half and both of us are doing podcasts and that amps uh it's like a multiplier because uh it causes a ripple in the the uh i guess universe and it just rapidly teleports you up into the more heavenly dimensions and there's a lot of things that do that not just podcasting but all because it causes self-reflection because I sit here and listen to myself in this conversation and I go, well, um, what caused you And then to say that? And sometimes sometimes I don't have to question what I'm saying because I know that I'm just free-flowing from source. But sometimes this stuff comes out and then later on I catch it and I'm like, ah, now I see things from the realm of cause and effect, like from the, so, the cause of that instead of just being caught in the effect of repeating the programmed response or something. Yeah, and any time that anyone hears your words, um, it's having an effect on their consciousness. And that's why you have to be careful what words you choose and you start to realize and recognize negative spell casting that is out there trying to trick people down bad paths. And you see that all the time on TV. I mean, one time. Yeah, a lot of words we use um, on a regular basis are actually trick words. They are like the word anarchy is tr the CIA weaponized the word conspiracy theorist. I mean, that's another one. Anarchist anarchy. Anarchy just means no masters, no rulers in Latin from like the Latin, like monarch or oligarch. Uh, arch, an archon is a ruler or dominator. Like um, the only person that you're allowed to rule over is your own consciousness and master you can master that which means that it's not running you with addiction and fear but you've mastered and overcome um the hang-ups and the fears and that's called mastering your own consciousness which is like the first half of the great work and at the same time a part of that you, you realize that everyone is all one on some level and so that if you just work on the other ones, that's at the same time leveling you up because just being able to put concepts like this into words is a skill and you get better and better at and more it flows more easy and you learn more and more powerful magic spells. Like the first time I got into it was with Mark Passio, really. And then I went and practiced it at this uh, place in Little Rock. It's called Socrates Cafe. And they have one here. I got kicked out of it because um, I think the leader was sort of a control freak. So, you know, but you can go if anyone's listening. I would encourage people to go. It's a little bit group thinky and you have to raise your hand. So it turned out that it really isn't the vibe for me anymore. But I went for like two years in Little Rock and I just went back every time and repeated Mark Passio's stuff and other people. And at first, I when I first went, I didn't even hear Mark Passio then, I don't think, because the question I posed was, is the economy being used to enslave the masses? And I had a really good idea about that. I didn't, I'd never heard of Mark Passio, so it wasn't, I wasn't so as sure of myself. Yeah, I, I came to that realization before I found a lot of information, actually. Yeah. I came to that in college. Yeah, but then, yeah, and I had seen information about the Federal Reserve, and it all seemed legit. I was like, I mean, this looks like exactly what's going on. And so I talked to it at Socrates Cafe, I posed it as a question. And I think they actually voted for it, and we talked about it for the night for like two hours. And the people, they just were not aware of it. They were like in total denial about it. They were like, well, who would do that? Who's going to – who? who's it? Who's they? Big <laughs> who's one. they? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, that the best way to answer the question of who's they 
I always come back to look in the mirror. You are the foot oh, soldiers of the brilliant. Illuminati. You, you are they because they could never exercise control over a truly free being and a right. free being being one that actually loves themselves yeah. and therefore respects themselves, has enough self-awareness to not engage in practices that harm any, any part of the all, whether yeah. it's their self or the external self, because it's all one self. And it's about developing courage, which is taking right action in spite of fear. And, you know, it, like it takes courage to do things that – you're not used to doing and to change your ways. Like if you were a police officer and you figure out that you're in a cult that is dominating innocent people for no reason, then, um, you, you know, it would take courage to quit that job because everything would change in your life and it would be a big deal for some of them. Some of them have only worked there a year, so it's not even that big of a deal, but some of them are so deep in that role that they've been playing, that false identity that their entire life started to uh, revolve around it. And then they picked up so much karma going down that path on a daily basis with all of the routine things that cops are required to do, like traffic stops and uh, you know writing people tickets and fines they, they, and picking up people for warrants. They don't know anything about you know the actual situation that happened. They just get a piece of paper and it says they have to go kidnap somebody because it's a warrant. And somebody told them to go to your door and then kidnap you, and they have no idea what you did because they weren't there. They just assume, based on this religion they've been programmed with, that their orders can never be uh, turned down. You have to obey. That's the system. So, if, yeah, this is what needs to be explained to people in your life that are uh, practicing order followers, and that is that – and it's a harsh reality, I guess, and it's hard to too because people identify these, you know, it's my father, it's my brother, it's my boyfriend, whatever, and they have a positive association that they make with the person who's in the role, and they misidentify that positive association with the role itself. Yeah. And really, the role, no matter what, if you are following orders and not thinking for yourself whether or not something's the right thing to do, yeah. No matter what, whether you're a cop or you do that at your job of, of just in your office somewhere, any time that you it, you just put aside conscience and just do something because you're being told to, because you're being paid to, because of any other reason other than you know it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. or that you specifically know that it's not wrong at least. You need to specifically know that you, the action is not harmful to others. Right. And then you decide whether or not to take it. Not just do it because you're told. Or and, because you're getting paid. Or because you're being paid. And that's that's the definite – somebody that doesn't think about whether something would be the right thing to do before they do it mm -hmm. is the definition of a bad person. Right. They are. That's and the definition. I'm, I'm sorry that see, it's hard to sand. understand a, that, a but it's real. The concept that Mark Cassio had in his presentations is that there's a line in the sand, and the only real divide between people is those who uh, – want there to be slavery and those who want there to be freedom. And it's, it's sort of a spiritual concept. And you can think of it more as a polarity under natural law where the people who like freedom float up to this higher polarity where everything happens to be much, much more pleasant there. And the people who don't like freedom and choose slavery, whether that means being a dominator or not standing up for yourself and not even saying anything when you see dominators taking everyone's rights, those people go further and further away from source until they either stop being a dominator or contribute, you know, contributing to the solution. The first step is to just stop the toxicity. But on this planet, we're like addicted to it because even I do toxic stuff. Like I killed like plants the other day because I was paid, you know, as, as a landscaper, I was paid to just chop plants up for, and it's like for no reason was we live in a control freak society where people are used to just dominating everything. And it's like a sickness where you're just wasting energy, chopping down the nature only because you don't like the way it looks kind of thing. And it's like, one, you know, all of this work is like mowing your yard endlessly, mowing the yard. over. Dude, I think over. about that all the time. It's every time I man. mow my yard. You know, and we're addicted to it because we're in this system that and you're using that do that. gas too, yeah. Because if you don't mow your yard, what happens? Well, then I can't go through it because it gets too tall, and is, I can't get is to my there garden. Anything else that happens? Because at my house, what oh yeah, my, if I didn't mow the front yard, I would have problems with the neighborhood, right? Right. Yeah, the neighborhood, which is the mini me government, and you know what the sick thing about the neighborhood government is? 
is that if they have a problem with you, the police, which is the state government, will enforce it. So, you, so if you don't mow your yard, the police will come to your house. And then what do they do when they come to your house and they ask you to mow your yard or that they need to warn you? Then what? I guess the next step is they put you in a cage uh, at the point of a I, gun. Well, I think there's a step between that. They okay. find you. They find right, you, right. right? Or who knows what they do. They might just try to intimidate you a bunch. But somebody else. I probably never has to go farther than that. Because I don't even think the police show up until you haven't paid the fine, because that is probably the first thing that happens. They send you a fine in the mail, and they're like, "You, we demand that you pay us." And then they're like, "Fuck that! I ain't paying shit. It's my, it's my yard, right?" Because here, who? who they have the piece the of paper that says my name on it that it's mine. Yeah. Well, the piece of paper doesn't even matter. That I know. What ownership is. I know. It's so Passio goofy. Passio teaches about this because it's fundamental to natural law, the concept of ownership and property. And So um, I'm here actively using it and making it a better place and upkeep, keeping it up. That's ownership, right? Yeah, you're using it. Uh, you're responsible for it. The, but we're all addicted to this karmic um, money system where people are taking care of properties supposedly that they don't even actually own really i mean they but but they're in this system that they've been in for so long so you could have like a small business owner who has like enough money to invest in real estate or something and that makes him a landlord of certain apartments and there's people who are stuck in that apartment and that's where they live and it's like you have adopted this fake role in a fake system of being their landlord, which means that you are taking authority over them and that they have to pay you, which is a slavery again. And then on the other part of it, um, going back to personal responsibility, when you live in a rented property, for the most part, people don't give a shit about that property. Well, that's because they take no responsibility <laughs> for any aspect of it that they aren't expressly so, forced to by the authority. So if in here's what happens, at least in my experience, when I lived in apartments, whenever there was when I lived somewhere where my only uh, my only responsibility to take care of something was being enforced by an authority. I would cut every corner possible and do as little as possible, whether that authority figure was my parents and it was my bedroom that I wasn't keeping clean or, yeah. you know, the apartment and building. That's and that's what the authorities want too. They want – that's a way of – well, it's just an odd – I guess people are just prone to that whenever – they don't give a – they just don't care whenever it's – uh well, David, because why would you care about it? That's an asshole authority figure that's telling you what to do. <laughs> right, and, and the part of the relationship that you're giving up responsibility for yourself in your own, your own home. That's part and, of slavery. Yep, yeah, that's part of slavery, and the masters know this is how it works, and so they're all too happy to take on responsibility and control of the things that you don't want to take care of, like the trash and the water, and you know who technically owns it. You don't you don't want to have to think about any type of uh, organic agreement with your neighbors. You don't even want to talk to them because they're strangers. I mean that's that's because you're too busy because you don't even have time to talk to neighbors because you're too busy going to your slave job to get enough money to pay the people to come take your trash away. And then it's like they don't go out of their house. That that's how it is on my street. I don't. I see people yeah, walking on the street, but it's like some days I'll go out there and it's like it's a ghost town. And I'm like, what are they doing in their boxes all day? And, and you know, during the daytime, a lot of them go to jobs, so it's just abandoned street. And I'm just like. This is almost eerie. It is really <laughs> eerie, dude. And that's like people are like, oh, there's not enough room for how many billion people there are on the planet. Well, um, think about how much wasted resources go on just in the fact that like you live in one spot and then you drive 20 or 30 minutes away to go spend eight hours of your day to get enough money to pay for the place that you're not even at most of the day. Yeah. And, what uh, the fuck? It's it's you start to see this pattern everywhere you look, and that's part of waking up. And uh, it's normal to have an, a little bit of an emotional release and uh, to get angry. And that's an, that's another semi new age uh, deception is that anger has no place and that it's never okay to be angry and that you should just forget about anger and don't do anything to fix the problem. You just meditate and don't be angry. There's toxic anger and then there's divine anger. You're right. So there's the two Jesus two parable. kinds. You know, Jesus got angry because he went to a place that was supposed to be God's house. And there was a bunch of money people ripping everyone off and turning them into slaves. And Jesus got so angry that he, he actually did their, something. He kicked their asses. Yeah, he did something to get, you know, to correct the problem. Didn't he like physically attack right. them? That, that's a divine right. Yeah, I mean, 
Which is he used it's a force. parable, you know. So right. who knows if it actually happened and whether or not he was God and he could never do anything wrong. I don't well, even but know. even <laughs> even in the case of do you th- do you think it's okay to use force to stop someone from enslaving someone? Because okay. I think so. Oh yeah, yeah. Especially if the person has given up consent, which is the first step to ending slavery, is take away your consent and don't support it anymore. Once someone has done that, then the universe comes in. It's like, yep, we're getting that guy out. Yeah, um, it's like there's an experiment going, and it's just – and the experimenter, the gardener, as as you called him, called it, is um, just seeing how far it can turn up the poison and the toxicity and the, the bullshit essentially until you say, I don't want to be a part of this experiment anymore. I quit. I don't want to be in this anymore. And I'm not doing it. that's the dark gardener. Yeah that's, yeah, that's just the person who wants to torture you. They, they're the ones – yeah, but they can't. But essentially, as soon as you make that statement, they have to stop. Everything in this universe, as an extension of you, therefore listens to you and responds to your intent. So as soon as your intention is that you don't want to be connected to this anymore, even though the the, the reason people don't understand that this is how it works is because things move so slowly in and this density level. This dream, the shared dream, things move slow because right. there's seven billion people and animals and everything contributing to this dream. So there's a so. there's an observer effect with all quantum phenomenon and everything big and small it has is a quantum of phenomenon because the word quantum means so, an amount yeah. and that means that when a certain amount of something takes place then something else therefore happens essentially and like suffering like there's what, a certain amount of suffering in the world this universe comes in is like oh man this place is just got to be cleaned up we might have to take out some grain alcohol and pour it on certain spots <laughs> that bad but so those that that happens not instantaneously so what you have to keep in mind is if the thing that you have put out there as a thought form that you intend to have happen for yourself, if it's going to actually happen, then certain – say like what – you want to be, you want to actually become a successful painter and get by selling your paintings as a way of your, making your livelihood. You know, that's going to require several steps to – like several, you know – parts of a formula to all add up to that yeah. quantum effect because but you have to actually start with the beginning of that you have to actually initiate the uh the will the will yeah, yeah and then the, the universe will do the steps required and it'll take x amount of time and then you'll get the result but you have to stay on selves it. have to learn like if you want to learn to play piano you're dealing with your body which is not exactly you and there's a time lag between the amount of t- when you decide oh i want to learn piano or how to play tennis and then your body now you have to work through this machine kind of not machine but it's a living thing that's another self and you're works trying through to, repetition you're trying to ask it to do this but you don't have complete uh control over it because it's not technically all the way you it's connected to your consciousness and that gives you control over it but it's kind of like a living puppet. It's a weird, very weird thing. and It is, but that's why you can keep – even if there's some kind of behavior that you want to stop doing or you want to start doing, telling yourself the, the correct message first definitely will get you closer there. And also definitely. you have to repeat it over and over again so that not just your body but the other bodies will get the vibrational yes, imprint of that out. energy because the words have a vibrational uh-huh. frequency that – frequency we the imprints upon the physiology yeah that's that's the end of the spell casting and getting out of the global enslavement that it that it takes so long to develop and you know the totalitarian tiptoe that david ike talks about where they just slowly ramp up the volume on all the 5g and the police state and the chemtrails they just ramp it up a little notch every day it's called the totalitarian tiptoe and eventually you're just like what happened i gotta get out of here and then that – only then does it really turn, start to turn around. And we're seeing this this year with a lot of this really nasty-looking stuff appearing everywhere. On the internet, all types of systems are just blowing up and, and turn – and the whole thing – it's like the emperor has no clothes on and he never did. Especially with the satanic pedophile sacrificial cults. I yep. keep forgetting that I'm not going to use the word pedophile anymore to even describe those people because – that yeah, word is actually a poisonous word. It means – the word etymologically means child lover and anyone that is yeah, engaged in ritual sacrifice, torture, and murder of children is not a child lover. Absolutely not. So they're a child murderer and rapist. That's very good um, 
that's their word for themselves on purpose. I'm going to adopt that strategy too because that they're is doing true. that on the purpose. Words, the way words are built, uh, your subconscious picks up on. That word is softening the crime intrinsically. It is, man. And it's actually poisoning the word file. It's a disgrace to the word love or phile. Disgrace to all words and all logos and all creation is. It is. Uh, and, and, you know, but this type. The other thing to keep in mind, though, is the violations that are being perpetrated on even adults the natural law violations that we're perpetrating against each other and that the state is perpetrating against um, everybody. everybody everywhere in every state. Even themselves. Even themselves. The order followers are putting themselves in the case. And their own children. And, and their, their own children. Yeah, it's crazy. So uh, all of, but all of those that. people that are that are doing this and that are having it done to them, whether or not they're physically children, your consciousness is actually like – your spirit, the soul part of you, although I guess there's a distinction that I don't quite understand between spirit and soul. Actually, I think I do understand it. Soul maybe is like the is the, the identity that carries through lifetimes and spirit is the emanation of source energy, you could say, that fills all living creatures. But um, uh, that, that, that greater non-physical part of your consciousness is essentially an eternal child. So all the perpetrations per, – all the natural law violations against any being is being done to children in a way. Yeah, because as above, so below. So if you're that's what if you're suffering, everyone's suffering. And if you see another person suffering, that means you are not completely out of hell yet. Because once you get into heaven, there's no suffering, and it's a polarity. Because that's an illusion. You go closer and closer and closer to no suffering, and then that means that the world looks more and more nice, and there's not as much people eating other people. And, you know, everything else they do and the animals get nicer and they'll let you pet them because they're not afraid anymore. And they're not trying to eat you like a bear. You could have, There's such a thing as a bear that's friendly and nice and it'll, you can just ride it all day. And it doesn't mind because it's not as hungry because it's not as physical because it has less karma because you have less karma because you made good decisions over the course of your lifetimes. And it took, you know, forever to get there. But that's sort of all you got is forever. Exactly. And maybe that's not happening on this planet right now, but it's happened before and on other planets. And um, that's another thing to bring up in terms of carnism is how. Absolutely. Let me go to the bathroom and then we'll talk Actually, about yeah. carnism. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go to the bathroom. I, I'm even going to. Yeah. I'm going to start talking about carnism even while Nathan's gone uh, because this is something I've been wanting to get through to my own family members more than anything i think because it's it's a, a really harmful practice not just to obviously animals that are being killed and eaten but to the entire field since it's all connected as we're saying and if we're slaughtering billions and billions of creatures all the time um and we're injecting that much fear into the collective consciousness and we're also grossly out of balance in our health and harmony do you think there's a connection there i think there's absolutely a connection there like if if you were just strictly a meat eater which you might be listening to this you ever noticed how many pounds of meat you can put away you ever noticed how insatiable the desire to just eat more of it is if it's available that's why they have these like south american style grills where they will bring you meat non-stop endlessly until you give up and why people can just go to Chinese buffets and eat forever because there's less nutrition in uh, in eating meat. It's harder for your body to actually assimilate that because that material, if you will, that matter is more individuated since it's coming from an animal consciousness. It is a more individuated form of energy and therefore it is more difficult to separate that energy energy from that form and incorporate it into yourself. So if you are constantly trying to assimilate only the energy of highly individuated other consciousnesses like animals, then your body is constantly doing a more work just to do that assimilation. And eventually that material that you're trying to assimilate is going to reject being assimilated and want to return to what it is oh yeah yeah this is very 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 profound and this goes down to the eternal process of learning how to detox and get back into less 
uh, dense physical reality. It starts with the microcosm of how your body operates and the foods that you take in and the energies. The most and important practice to change is this carnism practice. That is a, a big one for sure. Uh, there, there are so many, but that's a good choice. And especially for something that you can do now, you can do the great work on other people. You can do the great work on your own mind. And part of that and your own body has to have the great work too. And so that's an, a very practical thing that people can do. And I've noticed when you get on more and more high vibe stuff and less and less low vibe stuff, especially animal products are a very good example. That would be a top priority for almost everyone. Like people who are addicted to animal products, they think they need so much more of it than they actually do to even feel any discomfort. That's the, the trick about um, getting the, off of animal products. The more you eat, the less energy you have. Have you ever noticed that? There's a clue. The more meat you eat, the more of a food coma you're going to. Yeah. and I haven't uh, had a food coma in like over a year. Part of getting the food coma is the high fructose corn syrup. So it's not like oh, that's true too. meat has karma. There's so much karma in all different choices. It's like an infinite process of just uh, learning about more about the universe and expanding your own consciousness and awareness in all forms, all aspects of your consciousness. And by doing that, you're gifted with more knowledge, and then you can apply that new knowledge of how to further expand your consciousness, and you get closer and closer to source, and things get more and more vibrations more quickly, and that's you can see it uh, every day with the vibrations on Earth speeding up, and it's unlocking all of this stuff that has to be cleaned up, because it's all been hidden for uh, millennia from the from and people just they didn't have an intellectual grasping of their own enslavement a lot of times, especially like the generation before mine, you know, they, before the internet, they had no way to mass deprogram everybody. It was just like you know they were stuck. And they could telephone people, and eventually they got TV, but the TV was controlled by the dark occult right off the bat. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now, even with the internet, because there's so many voices cl clamoring for attention, you still can only get so many people people's attention. But this type of conversation, like we've had today, I think is crucial for each and every one of you guys listening to. Um, attempt to have with other people if you don't know how to do the great work in your life the only it's almost like well it's actually a lot like if you ever were subjected to church as a kid it's kind of like being a missionary um, the way that they want you to always witness all the time about uh, about your religion as they call it witnessing you could be a witness for natural law and it's really Really, all you have to do to be doing the great work and being a witness of natural law is to listen to your conscience. And whenever your conscience is telling you something, then go with that. Right. And uh, sometimes it wants you to do things <clears throat> that are like for the great work. Like that's well, that's how I got involved in all this is if I had so much fear that I wouldn't I would block the whole idea of the great work out of my mind, out of my mind. I mean, a lot of people are in that state, but they can get out of it. And the mind wants and the spirit wants to heal everybody, to get them out of the Stockholm syndrome and the denial of the problem. And if you do your share and you just admit, yeah, everything got messed up and it was always messed up. And uh, I tried to run from that and I tried to distract myself from it. But now I see that everything's messed up. And now I'm just going to at least accept, at least acknowledge that it's messed up and something needs to be fixed. And then it might be overwhelming for a while because you start learning more and more about how messed up everything really is. But at the same time, that's just a one half of a coin. Like uh, humanity has made uh, progress in many ways, and you can um, balance that out with things that make you feel good and try to sh – because your emotions are one of the most important things that has to change. Uh, ultimately, like if you can get to more happiness and less sadness, then everyone else in the world also gets there. But you don't want to have it be false happiness where you're just running from stuff because that's actually more fear. and. More love is where you you know you start to look at more stuff. That's sort of uh, a lot of what love is, and especially when you are you know choosing the right things and environments and, and things to take in to your body and your mind, and not just a bunch of garbage that's not going to help you. I think the reason why people get scared is that, like you're saying, the the higher perspective you reach, the more 
deep into the dark valley oh, you can yes. see, you know. Yeah, I listened to uh, one of Mark Cassio's older episodes when I heard that you had been started watching them. And it was like episode 28 or something. And he was talking about an allegory of this path of spirituality and right and the path back to heaven and back to God as being a very, very, very tall mountain. Oh, yeah, I remember this. Infinitely tall. And you start somewhere on that mountain. And a lot of people never take a first step to the higher or some of them just decide they just want to go down. Oh, they build a city at the foot of the mountain. Yeah, they just go down further and, and see what's down the mountain because that's easier than going up the mountain. And then you have the few that are tired of the vibrations lower on the mountain. And that could be, uh, you know, for any reason. That doesn't even necessarily mean that there's evil going on at the bottom of the mountain. But there could be. And some of them, in, in a lot of cases, there is evil going down um, on the lower densities like on Earth. And it's like... Um, now, if you want to get away from that and detox, now you have to go up the mountain. And the universe is like, yeah, well, if you want out of here, when they, now you got to learn all of this stuff. And you can get out. We can get you out. But you've, you're not, we're not just going to um, – because it takes energy to get people out. And um, we will help the people who are at least uh, trying to be aware. And the other people, you know, you just tell them the truth. And if they don't want to help themselves, they, you, they'll filter themselves right out of your life. And it won't even be – Big deal. Just, because all, you're, you're going to keep going up the mountain, and if they've pitched a tent, then you're going to say sayonara, and they're yes. going to stay where they're at, and you're going to move up the mountain. The tent pitchers. So you don't even have to them. actively – I was explaining this to someone else. You don't have to actively cut people out of your life, and in fact, you shouldn't be thinking along those lines. You should be thinking along the lines of – I want to actually be helpful and an illumination to the people in my life because if someone in your life does seem to be like an energy drain or a vampiric person and you do start doing the great work, they're going to either A, they're going to come around and maybe even go with you up the mountain, which maybe, depending on who it is, maybe that's not likely, but they're either that or they're going to be repelled by your energy and it's going to bring them right. so much closer to self-awareness that they're apparently so terrified of that they've set a pit or they've pitched a tent to avoid climbing the mountain <laughs> that they're going to get away from you automatically. So yeah, you don't really have to cut people out of your life. Uh, that's another um, new age deception in my opinion because the, do, the act of doing that creates karma between you and the other person as opposed to just naturally letting them decide that they don't want to necessarily yeah, so with, associate with you if they choose. as well. Yeah. Because the other half of the coin is if they are doing something to you that they don't have a right to do. That's like true. Pulling energy from you against your will and you re, and you and you first make it clear that you, that is against your will and that it's your energy and that they don't have a right to just drain it anytime they want. And then you re, and then then if that fails and they just keep attacking you, there is the the masculine half of the coin, which is where. You you know you defend yourself in the least harmful way that you can and try be, and try to get as little karma as you can because there there is almost like there's a collateral damage and there always is collateral damage because of the karma that the small microcosm karma that you get in self defense situations where for example a person attacks another person with like a knife or something I don't know a mugger and then the person um, pulls out a gun and shoots them, right? That There's a lot of collateral damage in that situation. And the collateral damage is the person who the attacker is his body, is actual microcosm level uh, life forms that were used probably out of the will of alignment of natural earth. And that wasn't exactly the same thing as his consciousness, but he forced, so he got all kinds of damage by forcing his body into that bad situation. But then you destroyed completely his body when there was a parallel universe where you could have been like an Aikido master, right. somebody very familiar with all It's not even a micro things. karma, you know, that's like a large amount of karma, karma to kill another person even if it is in self-defense. Well, compared to not hurting them in any way and disarming them and, and then telling them some sort of moral truth, yeah, you would get that. That's a better parallel universe potentially. And but you got to do one or the other. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you just do the best that you can and always remember that no one has a right to mess up um, your body either. So if anybody tries to, then you should uh, 
defend yourself if you want. Yeah, because they give up their universe. right to be safe if they try to violate your right to be safe. Yeah, that's how the universe works. And remember, there is collateral damage with their body not being exactly the same thing as their decision-making process. And you don't want to get into the situation of running into that exact same altercation in a future life where but, this time you get shot. Yeah, and it's your body is also separate from yourself. So your body is also collateral damage. So it's like if they attack you and you don't defend yourself, well, that means that your body took on a whole bunch of karma and that's directly connected to your consciousness. It's not that, that it's separate from – it's not that it's separate from yourself but that it's a being like any other um, that – I mean in a way it's separate but like you're – you are intrinsically connected to your body, so it's not completely separate. And things yeah. you do to your body affect your consciousness, so it's not Very separate weird. in that regard. But like, it does really help, as Richard was saying in the previous episode, to start looking at your mind and your body like a kid that you're taking care of. Yeah, because yeah, then you can uh, you can make the right decisions for yourself a lot more easily. Right. Speaking that, of taking care of like a kid. I got to take care of this kid and uh, wrap up this podcast because it's getting a little late. And Yeah, so uh, we're going to wrap this up. Yeah, nice brain dump. Yeah, good job. Um, everybody, make sure you check out Nathan's Freedom Zone. You can find that on SoundCloud. Uh, Crystal Demon is your SoundCloud username? Under Space Demon. Yeah. So, and um, also, uh, Nathan's. I'll link to it, though. With an apostrophe on the Apple Podcast app. Oh, you got it on there? Yeah, yeah. If you search Nathan's oh. Freedom Zone with an apostrophe S, Nathan's Freedom Zone, yeah, it'll pull it up and you'll see a picture of my face and kind of that chance actually designed it. It's kind of a little sort of Oh, shit. You're off mic right now. No. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Continue. I think it's picking up now. Oh, okay. Well, no big deal. It's just Nathan's Freedom Zone on Apple Podcast app with an apostrophe and, uh, soundcloud.com slash crystal underspace demon and i try to do the great work as best as i can and there's you know a lot of negative things on there that that people need to start facing but i also mix in uh the other half of the coin and i i feel like you, you need to have a balance between uh exposing negativity so that people understand that that they need to be looking into positive stuff because how are you going to even do that if you don't re recognize you know where suffering is even coming from so it's, it's a two-sided sword, sword, two-edged sword. Yeah, I'll link to that, and um, I've actually been sharing it on Minds. It's the episodes that I've got to check out. It's fun. I like listening to your progress. You are actually a really good host. Your personality, um, you know, we've been like kind of all business in this conversation. You should really check out Nathan's podcast because you're a lot more loose and free with your guests than people might expect from a conversation like this where we're like really on point and that's just because you and i are like unable to do anything but the great work when we're in each other's presence which is to just talk about this <laughs> so um which is probably a good thing but because i it's fun for us but uh your your show is actually quite entertaining and informative it's uh it's fun you have good personality quirks that make you a funny host and also a good uh, sharer of truth so I appreciate you coming over on a on a whim as well because I needed a podcast episode tonight for this week and I didn't quite get one so this is a this is a great one it's my favorite kind of episode just shooting the, shooting the breeze with a good friend it's exactly why I do it yeah we yeah we cranked out almost two hours man Wow. Pretty. Got going, yeah. That's what happens on my show too. Yeah, yeah, we got going. So, uh, um, hopefully, you guys can hear Nathan at the end there. His mic turned off or something. But anyway, say goodbye, Nathan. Bye, everybody. Um, welcome to Nathan's Freedom Zone. Whenever you choose to tune in, and love and light, balance and harmonious vibrations to you all. See you next week. Hey, we did it. We got through that whole episode. Hooray. I hope you guys liked it. I had a lot of fun in that conversation. It's always cool whenever your, I guess, job, I guess podcasting is kind of a job, involves getting to just hang out with friends. And that's exactly what that episode was. It was just a overdue hangout with a good homie. And I hope you guys liked it. And if you made it this far, why not go to the episode links 
in the description or wherever posted this episode is that you were uh, accessing it from. Go to the link. Follow Nathan on SoundCloud, Nathan's Freedom Zone, or subscribe on iTunes. And also, hey, maybe go check out our Patreon and donate some money as well because we really need your help. And we love you. And I hope that you have um, smooth sailing doing the great work in your own life. And may the force be with you and all that. And I'll talk to you next week. And I love you. And goodbye. <laughs>